everyone, this is Dennis Chang here. Welcome to another video. It's been a while. Last time I posted a video where I talked, I was in Osaka, Japan. Today, we're, which day are we? We're July 7th, 2023. And um, here I am in Paris, France. I'm supposed to be in Canada right now, but I ended up being stuck here. That's another story, irrelevant. But I thought I'd make another unscripted video about uh, some of the things that I've gone through in the past week that could be hopefully useful to some of you who are learning music. Uh, today I want to talk about accompaniment, uh, rhythm guitar and all that stuff, how to learn songs. But if you could just do me a little favor, you know, click that like button, subscribe, maybe buy something off of DC Music School or some music on Bandcamp or some of my lessons on SoundSlice, that would be really, really appreciated. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about my uh, experience playing at the Django Reinhardt Festival with Duved's group, the Transatlantic Five. Um, the rehearsal process and all that stuff. Because it's been very interesting over the past few weeks, even the past few months, living in Asia, East Asia, Japan namely, but also I noticed the same kind of um, general culture in terms of approach to learning music, uh, more specifically jazz music, versus the West. I don't know, the West is like what? <laughs> the rest of the world. Uh, there's quite a big difference. And I'm not here to say that one is better than the other. Actually, I see, I see everything as as it is, you know, not necessarily in terms of good or bad, but in terms of advantages and disadvantages. Um, I noticed that a lot, the culture in East Asia of learning music is a little bit, mm, I don't know if what the appropriate word is on the kind of almost academic side, almost like my friend, I think it was Daniel said, it's like acquired skill. Whereas in the West, I mean, in the West, you have a lot of different ways to approach music. But one way that you see is kind of like a lived experience. It's hard to explain. The point I kind of want to make is that when I'm generalizing, of course, and it's such a sensitive thing. I don't want people to say, oh, but what about this person? What about me? Oh, blah, blah, blah. That's not what I'm going for. It's just a big generalization that I'm doing here. But in Asia, like, they, they use a lot of charts. Uh, the iReal Pro is very, very popular. There's a song they don't know. Oh, let me look it up in the iReal Pro. Um, and ultimately, I think technology is a really, really good thing. There's, there's, there are certainly a lot of advantages to using these tools, but I've been able to notice certain big disadvantages, namely that people couldn't learn songs by ear, like simple songs or even just by looking, I, uh, you know, I did this rehearsal in Japan. Last minute rehearsal, I got called at the last second. They sent me the charts, all original music, music that I'd never heard before, um, and it's not standard music either, like not standard chord progressions like two five one or things like that. Um, kind of modern jazz. I had to sub for a guitar player to rehearse. But because I know how music works, um, because of this quote unquote lived experience that I learned from the gypsies really, I was able to memorize all the music, all the charts in one, like an hour or two. When I showed up to the rehearsal, the, the leader was like, wow, this is my own music and I can't even memorize it myself. And the bass player was like, wow, I've been playing this music for so long and I still can't memorize it. So it's not that I'm a genius. But I come from this world where music is more, oh, I don't want to say this without saying elitist, but it's more like it's really part of you um, because how you live your life, because how you surround your, yourself with music, how you listen to music, how you think about music. I was able to memorize all that music that way. And I trained to do this. Um, over many 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 years so those are the things I want to talk about here today accompaniment 
a lot of people sometimes they tell me, okay, I want to get good at gypsy jazz rhythm. And actually, what we, I spent the last two weeks with my good friend Christian van Hamert, who most of you know. He has a very successful YouTube channel, very successful online presence. And it's, the, the discussions we had have been very interesting, you know, because we, we, we all agree on a lot of things, but we also disagree on quite a lot of things. And I could see his point, I can understand his point of view, but what, was, what I particularly liked in the past two weeks is that he started to see a little bit my point of view as well. It's like, okay, I, I see what you mean now when you say this and that. Um, so one thing that he said, like, rhythm guitar is not hard. You just, six months, and you can play rhythm guitar that is, quote-unquote, not offensive. And he's right. Rhythm guitar isn't necessarily hard. It shouldn't be hard, like, it, compared to soloing. Soloing is hard. But if you spent, like he says, um, I don't know, six months really focusing on getting the, the, the basic, basic fundamentals down, then you should be able to play basic rhythm guitar or bass or whatever. And a lot of it is, there's obviously the technical aspect, but there's also the, um, the artistic, philosophical aspect of how to play play rhythm like where to put the beat what which chord voices to use and all that um, it doesn't take much to do the bare minimum and that's the point that he is making but then the point that I'm making is that okay you're right that's something that you should uh, be able to do and unfortunately actually a lot of people are not even able to meet the bare minimum that's another topic but then once you get that there is this whole thing this whole artistry thing and that's one of the reasons why i really love working with people like uh for example duvet donayevsky jonathan stout uh Chalimberger, um where they have a very 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 specific vision of how accompaniment should be not how it should be but how they want to be accompaniment uh, how they want to be accompanied and this um requires a lot more work um, in the grand scheme of things still easier than soloing that's why I love playing rhythm it's just for me it's so stress-free um, people ask me if I was nervous when I'm when I'm nervous playing on stage accompanying these artists on playing for thousands of people no when I play rhythm I'm generally not nervous at all I'm concentrating on doing a good job of course but for me I worked on rhythm so much that once I know what I have to do. I can just sit back and relax and just do my job. So ultimately soloing is much harder. But this whole artistic way of playing rhythm, uh, which Christian admits himself he's not interested in doing, uh, it's, it's, it's another thing. And that's what I want to talk about here today. Maybe some of you might be interested in this. this I decided kind of long ago that I didn't really care so much to be a soloist. I play solo, you know, jam sessions. It's something I do for fun. But professionally, I just love accompanying really, really great artists because I can learn a lot from them and I can play with them. It's kind of a life hack. How to play with your idols, learn to support them. <laughs> so on the topic of using charts, I think it's definitely fine to use charts. But at one point, you also have to learn how to let go of them. And it's, we, Christian and I agree on the same point. Like if you, there's a song you don't know, um, and there's a chart available, use it. Look at it once, maybe twice, and then after put it away and just have it in your memory. So that you can concentrate on listening to both what you're playing and also what's going on around you. Because I have definitely noticed that people who overly rely on charts, they're just reading symbols and there's no, there's nothing happening here in terms of listening. So they, they never learn how to absorb the music, so to speak. And that's another topic of it on its own. But um, Christian and I noticed this quite a lot over the past two weeks. And ultimately, this becomes the difference between an instrumentalist and an actual musician. An instrumentalist might be able to do a lot of impressive things on the surface, but behind, they can be lacking on several 
uh, fundamental points and this is one of them so it's kind of quote unquote fake and if you're really really serious about music then I, I urge you to consider some of the points that I'm going to be making in this video so for those of you who are who are interested in quote unquote advanced accompaniment um, I don't suggest taking lessons once you have a basic understanding about of how the mechanics work how the sound kind of works it becomes time to do some some research on your own or to find opportunities to be able to accompany as many amazing musicians as possible so you can learn from this you can learn about the way they want the music to be played and one thing about myself that affects how I approach music how I learn music is that I don't really belong to a community so to speak it's kind of like like gypsy jazz or any style of music it's almost like high school where you have like the cool kids the nerds whatever the jocks and all these different groups I tend not to want to be part of any one in particular but to just explore every single one of them you know I remember like when I would go to New York sometimes I'd get together with different people and gather them and people who live in the same city will have never met each other but then they become good friends and that makes me really happy the same thing in Paris like I hang out for sure a lot with Duved and Daniel Garlitsky who are like family to me I love those people I love you guys if you're watching this but also I'm very much uh, friends with other people in the other groups and yesterday was kind of fun I took <laughs> I brought a uh, duvet to see the gypsy jazz musicians and tomorrow I'm taking Daniel to see the gypsies in Alsace so stuff like that makes me happy so because I'm in all these different groups I find myself in a situation where I have to de develop certain skills in order to be able to adapt very very quickly to learn very very fast if I can say I have one quality about my, myself is that I can learn music extremely extremely fast I train to be able to do this and this proved to be very very beneficial because in order to rehearse for this concert at uh, Samoa um, actually I didn't have time to practice beforehand because I was in Japan I don't live in Paris first of all so I can rehearse with the band and then just the week before the, the concert, I was at Django in June where I was busy uh, teaching and then also suddenly Jonathan Stout asked me to, to play bass and I had to memorize his entire set in pretty much half an hour. There was no time, almost no time to rehearse and I hadn't played bass in a long time so I, that, that was actually a little bit stressful because bass is not my main instrument. The fact that I hadn't played in a while, I was kind of nervous and also there was no rhythm guitar player. I was alone supplying everything so that made me a little bit nervous but I managed to prevail I mean there were some glitches of course but um, because I trained to be able to learn very fast I managed to prevail Thank you. 
So then, <laughs> Django in June ended on that Sunday, drove back to Montreal, headed straight to the airport, flew into Paris, and then went to super jet lag, went to uh, the bass player's house with Duved, and he, shot, he showed me the songs. The entire repertoire I, I learned, I kind of memorized, stored it into my short-term memory, all the songs. Then the next day we had a gig at a hospital where we played the entire repertoire. And um, what was cool was that the bass player is such a good player that he's playing simple bass lines where you can hear the harmony clearly. And there was another rhythm guitar player at PF who had rehearsed the, the material beforehand. So as we did that concert, I was watching his fingers, I was listening to them and just relearning what I had learned the day before. After the gig, which is the video that you saw at the beginning of this clip, we went to a park to go through the songs one final time. And um, that's pretty much how we rehearsed for this gig. I had to memorize all this really, really quickly, all the chords. And Duvet, what I like about Duvet is he's kind of spontaneous as well. He likes to change things on the fly. And uh, sometimes, like, okay, um, he'll decide that's going to be played one way. Then just before the concert, it's like, all right, we're going to change this thing in the, the second A. We're going to play this chord instead of that chord or do this and do that. So you really, really have to be on your toes. And I really like to be in this, these kinds of uh, situations because it's kind of the ultimate test for me to see how fast I can learn and how well I can adapt. This is kind of the education that I got from playing with the Gypsy community. It's because they themselves don't have names for a lot of the things that they do. There are very few of them who know theory. Um, and I remember I took some of my friends, my Korean friends and my, uh, my buddy Gyan, to see the Reinhardt uh, family at their campsite. And we, we kind of started jamming. And my friend, one of my uh, gypsy friends, who's not a professional musician, he plays bass at the church, but he has a daytime job. And he was, tell he was just telling me, Oh, Dennis, man, I'm not a pro musician. Like, uh, I'm a little bit nervous. But I noticed... He had this skill that I'm talking about. We were started playing songs that he didn't know, but he would look at our fingers or listen and get the bass line from that. He learned quite quickly. I mean, it wasn't always perfect, but this is what I'm talking about. This this ability to to have the music so much in you that that, that you can learn by listening or even watching. So my first tip is to learn as many songs as possible. Um, preferably songs that you have the opportunity to play regularly. So if you go to a jam session, hopefully there is a jam session wherever you live, go there every week and see which songs are being called. Learn them so that you can play them, at least accompany them. And try to find as many people to play with and learn the songs that they want to play. Learn them Use charts if you have to, but be aware that sometimes there are different ways to play the same song. Right? I've talked about this in, in previous videos. And then learn, if, in the case maybe of gypsy jazz for example, but in, any style of jazz really, don't be a slave to your fingers. Because a lot of people, let's say gy gypsy jazz, they, they automatically have their go-to shape. Let's say G major, E minor, you know, A minor. D7, but consider different possibilities. This is a G major. This is a kind of G major as well. This E minor, this is G major as well. Here's an E minor, 9, E minor 7, an E minor triad. Explore all these different options because this is where it gets really important at the higher level when, when the kind of the artistic way of accompaniment, it becomes very important to choose the appropriate chord voicings for the appropriate situation. So if I'm playing um, like New Orleans jazz, and I've seen this, I just saw this like yesterday, you know, some of these days, this is so not in the style. Da -da -da -da. Maybe 
maybe appropriate for a kind of modern gypsy jazz way but if you want to do like New Orleans style or 30s style whatever this would be more appropriate <laughs> very aware of such uh, nuances maybe one day I can make a video about the difference between swing music early 30s late 30s uh, bebop gypsy jazz what difference there are because it's all about little things like this and also about the time feel so you have all sorts of little things like this that you're gonna have to be very mindful of so there we go by doing this you're gonna create some kind of connection between your instrument and your ears that, that you kind of just absorb the music that you just uh, feel it at the instinctive level and again one thing that I love about working with Duvet is that he has such a clear vision about how he wants to be accompanied, accompanied for different songs as many of you know there is no one single right way to play swing rhythm or gypsy jazz rhythm whatever you want to call it both at the level of the chord voicings but then also the right and left hands the duration how you strike the strings for certain songs he would tell me oh i want it this way and for other songs oh don't do it that way do it this way for example we have this one song it was like wanted that feel as opposed to which is a different sound sometimes instead of doing you know this we'd be playing like this or more like this lots of different things and again that's just this whole artistic thing that I really really love about rhythm playing and then there's also the bass player Scott who's done his homework he's sometimes suggesting different feels by the by either playing in two or either playing in four feel or varying the duration of the notes or playing certain figures that that are that kind of inspire me to play rhythm in a specific way so listening listening and just having the music just be part of you so I thought I do for you is kind of like simulate what I had to go through see if you can do what I had to do imagine that you just show up to the rehearsal you don't know what the songs are I'm gonna teach you this one song which is uh, it's called I hope Gabriel likes my music and Louis Armstrong recorded this one and Duvet has this whole arrangement this whole thing and during the rehearsal we were changing things as well I remember Daniel complaining, ah, oh, this these sets of chord changes, like it doesn't allow me to do this, so then we start having this discussion. But anyway, we ended up settling for something like this. So here's the audition. I'm gonna teach you the song uh, and the arrangement. See how fast you can get it. Okay? It's an A A B A form. The melody the chord structure, the chords for the melody will not be the same as the chords for the solo. So here it is for the melody. There's a bass intro and then it does this. I'm not going to tell you the names of the chords. Try to look at my fingers and listen. I'll tell you the chords later. But I'm also going to make it easier because I'm going to show it to you in sections. With Duvet, he just played the whole thing and I just had to get it. Uh, and if you want to do that, then actually go back to the beginning of the video and try to learn that way. Watch my fingers. But here it is, broken down, so easier. First A. That was the first A. Let me tell the chords. D minor, A7, D minor, A7. One whole bar D minor. Then, well, okay, I can A flat diminished or B. I played B diminished just because I like this shape here. But I can take any of those diminished chords. Then F, F sharp diminished, G minor for a bar and a half, then A7. Going on to the second A now. Same thing.
So you have a G minor, C7, F, B section. All right, I'm not even gonna tell you. It's honeysuckle rose in the key of F, plus a little, and uh, I found a new baby ending. Let me show you. F7, B flat, to G7, to C7, one bar, A7, that's I found a new baby. The ending to I found a new baby in the B section. Okay, final A. much the same thing D minor A7 D minor A7 D minor then that diminished thing and then you have this so notice that I don't do this it's very typical in the 30s 20s style is instead of doing G minor 7 to do just G triad for the two chord or G minor 6 to C minor so it's a stylistic thing That, you do that three times, then G7, C7, F, A7. That's, those are the chords when you play the melody. Then the soloing part, the changes are simplified. Here are the first two A sections for, uh, for the solos. That was one A, but you do that twice. So, main difference is that you make the chords last longer. Instead of, you do this. Then you have this 1, 6, 2, 5 progression. last A section is the same. So that's the violin solo. So the violin is going to do a solo, then when the lead guitar comes in, you have to do a break. So it's the same chords for the soloing, but you just do this at the beginning of the guitar solo. One, two, one, two, three, four. Just that part, okay? Now after the guitar solo, you also have, you have to do another break for the bass solo. The bass is gonna do a little thing, and then the violin is gonna come back, and you have to play the chords to uh, the the melody version of the chords. Play for two bars. You do that for both A's, and then go into the B section. So, the final A, going to the ending. You'll notice that in the beginning video, I missed it, because I wasn't exactly sure if I had to, what, what it was that shot at the end. It was this, so. That. I stopped here just to hear what Dubai was going to do. Then he can see him tapping on my shoulder. Hey, I think you got to do this too. So there we go. See if how long it took you to, to memorize all this, to get all this. I had to do it in one go. Not to show off or anything, but it's, I mean, I trained to be able to do this. See how long it takes you to do this. And the faster you can do this, the more you'll be able to learn a lot of songs. And what's the benefit of all this? The reason why I've been able to befriend all these great musicians is because of this skill. I get invited to jam with all these players because they know I can do this. Um, that's kind of the reason why. Vavao asked me to record an entire album with them because he knew I could learn the songs like that. And um, I taught those songs and then after to uh, Hono 
Winterstein. Because for them, a lot of these gypsy players, they don't have the words to communicate these things. And sometimes they don't even know about like structure or sections. So for when I taught, and because I have a lot of experience communicating and sharing, I, could, I couldn't use words to, to teach Hono, but I could at least break things down for him in, order, in, a, in an easy way for him to understand. And Hono is one of those fast learners as well. So there we go. Did you pass the audition? <laughs> if not, it's okay. This is kind of an advanced thing. If you're a beginner, don't worry about this. I would just suggest that you start by learning songs, being able to play the rhythms to the songs, the rhythm guitar part, without a chart. Use a chart in the beginning, then ditch the chart. Listen to different recordings to hear the, the different versions that exist, different uh, subtle variations in harmony, and go to jam sessions, meet a lot of people, play with a lot of people. I can't stress enough this importance. You have to go meet as many good musicians as you can and find the opportunities to play with them. That leads to another topic, this topic of hierarchy. Again, one of the reasons why a lot of these great players like me is because I understand hierarchy. And uh, that's another big topic that I can talk, it's a sensitive topic, but uh, it's something that came up quite a few times over the past weeks at Django and Jung, also at Samwa, where some really amazing players we're not so happy with some people who didn't understand hierarchy. It's unfortunate because if you don't understand hierarchy, let's say you get the chance to play with a, with a really good player, however that chance comes up, but you play with them and you're so happy, oh, I got to play with so-and-so, but then after that you leave and so-and-so complains to me, man, that person doesn't understand hierarchy. I don't want to play with them anymore. Don't invite them anymore, Dennis. So this is very, very important another topic I've been very very blessed to have been able to learn music with a lot of the best players because of things like this so hopefully what I had to say here can get you to think a little bit maybe inspire you to work this way as well so there we go thank you very much see you guys soon